We'll see the red sign say to stop. <laughs> and I will jump in um, because we really need to hold to that time uh, limit. Um, so after we had a chance to hear from the candidates, um, their responses to the eight prepared questions, we will take a short five minute break. And after our break, we will then take questions from the audience. Uh, the questions though should be written on the three by five yellow cards and handed to Dan or Tessa at the table. They will be seated outside in the lobby. Um, another point of information is that all candidates will answer all questions. So a question from the audience needs to be written in such a way that it's directed to all the candidates, not to a specific candidate. Um, and then after we are completed with audience questions, candidates will have a two, minute, two minutes for a closing statement. So that's our general format. What I will do to keep the randomness in place is I will say whose turn it is and who is essentially on deck. So that person will know that they are, they are next in line to respond. Okay, I think we're good to go. Um, so we will start with our opening statements. And first we will hear from, um, let me just actually introduce the candidates, Bob Colby, Robert Chavez, Paula Nunez, Danye Laurent, Christopher Neary, Diane McNeil, and Jeannie King. And we will start opening statements with Danye. The microphone is there. There's two on each end, so you can kind of share. To be followed by Jeannie King. Okay, testing one, two, three. Four. <laughs> My name is Danye Laurent. I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, and I'm a great grandmother. I've been in this community for approximately 33 years, and I think um, what I want is what most parents want in this community, and that is a great education for their children um, and to improve their achievements. Can you hear us? And let's see, help them become productive citizens. In our community. We can't hear you. If to give the students a chance to become productive citizens in the future. Thank you. Next, we'd like to hear from Gina King, to be followed by Bob Corbett. Mrs. Sonna? Yes. Is this on? Yes. There we go. Uh, my name is Jeannie King, and I'm a retired teacher and a grandmother. And uh, I've lived in Willits since 1980. And I um, work for the, uh, I'm a retired special ed teacher. I have, um, I was the first in my family to go to college. And I have a teaching credential in special ed and a master's degree in uh, working with uh, uh, special ed children. And I uh, taught from, uh, for about, um, anyway, I worked for the Willits Unified School District since from about 1988 to about 2005. And um, I have volunteered in my grandson's classes, uh, kindergarten through fourth. He's currently in fourth. And I'm also a member of the Rotary Club and have been very active in the Rotary Club and I'm on their board. So I uh, feel strongly about, um, that uh, I love children, that's my agenda, as I care deeply about children and I care deeply about their receiving the skills and the tools and the support they need to be successful in this world, not only academically successful, but uh, also emotionally successful. And um, that's basically my agenda, To I feel that the school district's going in a good direction right now, and I would like to be part of that. So. Thank you. Next is Bob Colvin to be followed by Paul Menendez. Hello, I'm Bob Colvin. Um, 
I'm currently a member of the Willits Unified School District Board, and I feel that the Willits Unified School District over the past uh, few years has made a lot of changes that are improving student academic performance, and we're in a third year of, of changes, and I want to be on the school board so I can be around and, and assist where possible to continue that improvement. Thank you. Can. Well, I'm interested in being on the school board also, mostly for the well-being of our students. I've been an employee of the district for a little over 40 years, and of that time I've been to about 30 years worth of board meetings, which can show you my sincere dedication. The other thing that's really important to me is that we have a transparent, fully inclusive board looking for the best interest of all of our students, making sure that equity is a priority for everyone to have the opportunity to learn. I've lived here since 1978. Both our girls were raised and went through the schools here. And now they're back in Mendocino County working. For my way of thinking, that's an excellent thing to have happen. And they came through an excellent system within the district and I'd like to make sure that that continues for all of our future children, our grandchildren, our nieces, nephews, whatever comes along. I firmly believe in being involved in one's, um, one's future. I figure our children are the things, are the people that will take care of us with the things that are the very most important for when we are beyond those years where we are taking care of ourselves. And the best way I feel they're going to get that is when they have a truly strong, truly basic foundation and can make choices and decisions that will be in the best interest of everyone. I've always done a lot of community service. I naturally really care about children. And I just figured one of the better ways for me to extend that part of me is to be on the board. I've already been a teacher and an administrator, and I'm all done. Thank you. This is Robert Chavez, Chavez followed by Christopher Neal. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here this evening. I was excited when I got to come here this evening. Right, Bob? Yeah. <laughs> um, I've, uh, I grew up, and I, I grew up in an impoverished uh, neighborhood and uh, there were a lot of social ills at that time that was going on and this was in Fresno and um, I had a father and back there when you could tan someone's hide he would do it and uh, he set me straight and so I was able to navigate through all of that but um, we were very poor I didn't know it at the time but we were and and what I found is that the public education system that really changed our lives, not just mine, but all my brothers and sisters, we all graduated from four-year colleges, and it changed our way of life and that generational poverty that we see so many of our children and communities in. I was able to uh, rise out of that as well as my, uh, my brother, my brothers and sister. And, and I believe in our public education. I believe that we can, we can actually address many of those social ills or generational poverty that, that is associated with, with the problems that we have in our society. Um, to do that, we really have to uh, give our children as many choices and as many venues for them to be successful in the, in the, in the real world. Um, whether it's to go on in college or whether it's to go on to the vocational um, programs, but to be very successful. And um, should I be elected to the school board, um, that would be my push, is choices and a quality education for all our children. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Christopher Neary, followed by Brian Hello, uh, is this on? No. Is this on now? Okay. Uh, my name is Chris Neary. I'm an attorney and rancher uh, here in town. I, when I came in tonight, I realized that the last time that I was on this platform, 
1966 when I was graduating from high school. So I don't think I've been up here since. Um, after, uh, after graduating, uh, I went to law school, college, came back, opened my practice, was honored in 1980 to become a member of the school board, uh, and I served for 12 years. Uh, when uh, I got off the board in 1992, this, this district was in fairly good shape. Um, the uh, high school was considered a distinguished school, um, which really meant something. It was one of the top uh, 95, it was in the 95 percentile of all high schools of this size in the state. Uh, I kept track of school activities and the school board's doings uh, you know, from a distance for several years. And in 2013, I sensed that there was some, uh, the district was facing some fairly major uh, issues. The first being that the, the high school was in danger of losing its accreditation. Uh, so it's gone from, it went from a distinguished school to a high school where uh, colleges wouldn't accept high school students' grades uh, or, or achievements as, uh, as credits. Uh, I also uh, noted that there was a, a particular uh, controversy about the bonds that had been issued in 2000, I guess in 2010. And because I'm involved in representing the municipal governments and I know a little bit about bonds, I thought I could throw my hat in the ring. So, sure we did, and I'm on, I came back to the board in 2013. I think that one of the primary uh, duties of the board is to select administrators, uh, and we have you, done a good Mayor. job. So I hope to see that the, the, uh, the, the success of the district uh, uh, continue. It's, I think, uh, it going in a very good direction. Thank you. And last, we'll hear from Diane McNeil. Hi, I'm Diane McNeil. I arrived in uh, Willits teaching kindergarten in 1978 and then went to third grade and three, four combination and then finished in fourth and retired in 70, 19, yeah, two years ago. <laughs> anyway, I'm having a good time. Um, I enjoy teaching and I've loved what my kids did. And I know when I was teaching kindergarten, it was um, important that all the kids learned um, their alphabet. They were starting to read when they exited. And the first grade teachers were thankful for what we did. And the same thing I noticed that about the first grade, second grade teachers were always thanking the class behind the teachers they had before. And same thing in third. And then I notice um, now that when we have students, uh, they're coming from, um, I think our schools are at 75% um, free and reduced lunch, but that doesn't mean they can't learn. They are really smart kids because uh, you can give them an opportunity and when you get them into um, intervention programs, you see their scores go up. And we have that going with the third and the fourth grade teachers that I worked with at Blosser. And that was amazing. Um, we had distinguished schools. I would like to see more distinguished schools. The high school um, getting their scores up and um, uh, mainly just, um, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So now we will uh, pose our first question prepared by the sponsors of this forum. And uh, question one, what are the primary duties of a school board member? And describe your experience, if any, in these types of duties. So we will hear first from Bob Colvick to be followed by Diane McBee. Well, uh, Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the responsibility of the school board is to uh, set policy and then uh, hire the superintendent to then implement that policy. And uh, in terms of administration experience that I've had, I've been uh, a teacher, a counselor, uh, a middle school assistant principal, a middle school uh, counselor, uh, 
an interim principal and uh, run a variety of uh, support organizations for counselors within uh, Mendocino County, working for the, uh, the Mendocino County Office of Education. So I've been involved in a wide variety of educational positions and uh, I feel that my experience and background in those positions helps me to be a more knowledgeable uh, school board member. Thank you. So I, I fail to remind you that we have one and a quarter minutes to respond to these questions. Can you guys talk louder? Because I know some of the people can't hear you as well. Can you hold that thing close so we can hear you better. You need to hold the microphone right up to your face. You need to keep the microphone. You need a better sound system. I can't hear you. Next, we will hear from Diane McNeil to be followed by Danye Laurent. Um, school board members are elected by the public, you guys, and you have the right to vote who you wish. And our main purpose on the school board is education. That should be our bottom line first. Then we do take care of, um, I don't know, <laughs> I'll find out, but we take care of, um, I know we have um, facilities to take care of. We hire a superintendent. The superintendent takes care of um, all the um, business places. But the purpose of the school board is mainly working on education and making sure that, this, that our kids are progressing that from one grade to the next. And to make sure that if they are not, let's work on um, seeing what kind of interventions, what kind of programs we can establish, and policies that we can do to make sure that they're happen happening. And the bottom line for a school board member is education is our first thing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, next we will hear from Danye to be followed by Chris Murray. Sorry guys, I wasn't on. And I would like to ask uh, Ms. Sherry if she will repeat that question. Sure, please. gladly. What are the primary duties of a school board member? And describe your experience, if any, in these types of duties. So I think it's a school responsibility to definitely um, push our children to reach their highest potential possible. And if it Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. So, when I, what I'm saying is that children need to be need to come first. The decision making needs to be based on what is in the best interest of the child in the child's family. I believe because that plays major roles in um, learning as well. And so, I would base most of my decisions on what is in the best interest of the child, with definitely research data. As well. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Chris Neary, followed by Jeannie King. The, the duty of the school board, for one thing, the school board members are elected from the community to represent the interests of the community in overseeing the educational system. Uh, board members uh, are involved in setting policy as as Trustee Colvick mentioned, and, and that really is the primary function of the, of the school board. Uh, the, the policy is implemented by uh, administrators, and I think that you will see that if you look at our administrators today, across the board, we have top-notch administrators in every position. I think it's the best lineup or team of, of administrators that this district has seen for many, many years. Uh, so that's the primary function of the, of, the, of the board. We are not administrators or super administrators or quasi-administrators, uh, and we need to stay out of the day-to-day -day affairs of the, of the district administration, but we do have to hold the administration accountable. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Diane 
Next we'll hear from Jeannie King to be followed by Paula Nunez. My name is Jeannie King, and uh, I feel that the job of a, a school board trustee is to set policy, to uh, oversee things enough to know that good administrators are hired, and um, to um, that we're elected from the community, and be aware of what the community um, um, uh, what, what their um, how they feel about the schools, and to be aware overall of how the schools are doing, to set policy, and to hire good administrators so the good administrators can can carry um, those policies out. And I think the school district currently is doing very well at that. We have an excellent set of administrators. And uh, they're uh, pointing the school district in a very good direction. Um, I, have, um, I have experience in education, having been a teacher for many years, but I also have been on the Rotary Board for the past seven years. And uh, so I know what it's like uh, to sit on a board and to give direction and uh, to, uh, to set policy. So uh, I feel I'm adequately prepared to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Paula to be followed by Robert Chavez. Okay, well it depends in my opinion on which author you want to pay attention to when it comes to what is a school board's responsibility. The two most popular ones I've found say that Always a, a school board's major responsibility is to set policies and to represent the community. The other one that counters it just a little says that although those are the two important functions, it is especially important to remember that the community sends their children to the school district. And so education is a prime responsibility, as well, of course, as is personnel. There are people who believe that personnel is not a, a major concern of the board other than just the administration. However, no one in the district is ever hired without the approval of the board, any more than anyone is ever let go without the approval of the board. It always comes in the board minutes and it always um, needs approval. The reason I believe I have plenty of skills is because I have opened a school. I've served in just about every position that a school has, except that of superintendent and bus driver. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. And last one we'll hear from Robert Chavez. I can almost say ditto. I mean, you're, I don't want to rehash what everyone has said, but um, a school board is somewhat of a watchdog for the community to make sure that the superintendent is leading his administrators and teachers to do the correct thing for their children. To also be a conduit from the community to the school district and from the school district to the community. Um, obviously, you know, there is the policy, the, the uh, taking care of the budget and so forth and so on. But I feel the, the biggest responsibility of a school board is in the hiring of the superintendent. The superintendent is key and is very important in, in driving the direction of the school. Um, the only other thing that, um, the other big thing that I believe a school board is for is setting the vision and the focus of the district. So when you hire a superintendent, he, he must align with the vision and the direction of the school district. I have been involved for over 20 years in the school district as an administrator, as, as a teacher, um, and as a district administrator, and I've been involved in board meetings both in open and closed session during this time. Thank you. Our next question, as you see it, what are the key issues currently facing the district? We will start with Jeannie King to be followed by Chris Neary. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. As you see it, what are the key issues currently facing the district? Jeannie King here. The um, key issues as I see them are um, that um, 
we um, are redirecting our district to improve our um, academic scores. We've um, um, uh, uh, brought new curriculum into the school district to try to do that. We've improved, uh, we, uh, 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 we have improved um, the scheduling at the middle school. We've brought back programs at the high school. We got a little bit behind and we got a little bit, uh, our um, score started to go down and we're realigning ourselves and uh, taking a really great effort at improving the schools and I think the schools are going in a great direction right now. And I also think that our facilities need a tremendous amount of help. The, old, the newest school we have in the district is Blosser and that's 30 years old and our schools really need um, need uh, some work on them, some physical work too. That's another issue. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Chris Neary to be followed by Robert Chavez. I think the, the key issue facing the district today across the board is we have to improve academic success. Uh, I, the way you do that is by uh, improving the curriculum, improving the environment, and I think that process is well underway. I think another key issue, is, as Jeannie pointed out, is that the facilities really need to be addressed and, and that we don't have the kind of budget that allows us to address the, the deferred maintenance. If you walk around the high school after tonight's meeting, I think you'll find that it's in as, in as good a shape as it's been for many years, but it still needs some big ticket fixes. And uh, so I think that's one of the other issues. But I think it's academic success and facilities, and that's what I think the board's going to be focusing on uh, for the next several years. Thank you. Yes, we'll hear from Robert, followed by Bob Golden. Okay. Um, the issues that are facing our district that I see is the size of our district. We're a smaller district, and take the high school, as we were just talking about it, we may not offer as many courses, we may not offer as many activities as, let's say, a school of 2,000, 3,000 in size, which I've worked at. And so one of the things that we really have to work with as a community is how do we get, how do we get choice to our children out there? How do we get them access to those high academic programs or those vocational programs to make them competitive as they leave our school district? Um, and I believe that is where we have to focus. I'm very excited about some of the gains we've made in the last few years. Uh, we have opened up the voc ed programs. Um, we have done some intermingling and choice amongst our elementary schools. Um, and of course, we are always working on quality, which is necessary. So again, I think the big, the big thing that we face is choice. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Bob, followed by Daniel Laurent. Well, our challenges here in Willits are the same as with most school districts to provide the best education possible within the constraints of the, the budget. And uh, I think that right at this point we're doing very, very well within the, the budget that we have, but we need to plan ahead. Uh, we've talked a little bit about facilities, and the, the facilities are going to need to be. Uh, attended to soon, and uh, we need to figure out ways to make sure that we can pay for that. Thank you. Next is Gagne, to be followed by Diane McNeil. Hi. So right now I believe the key, well, the main key issue which is what we're always going to be facing is going to be student education and achievement. That's going to be our number one key, and it's going to be an issue that's going to be ongoing. So the school and education exist. Giving that, uh, excuse me, now. along with other major factors that play key roles in the students learning, or other issues that are out there in the community that we're not, you know, 
really looking into because we're, we're focusing more on student education, but we also have to realize that there's things that some of our children are going through out there in the community, which homelessness, um, families in crisis, and livable wages. So those are our key issues that are actually going on in our community at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Diane to be followed by Paula Nunez. Let's see, um, mainly the reading program that has been um, Mr. Westerberg had for, is it, it's a um, beginning phonics? Unlocking the code. Unlocking the code. Um, that's our, my main need is to getting kids to read. Kids need to be reading by third grade. And I had a colleague that came from San Hedrin um, high school and transferred down to third to teach and he says these are the student this level that I'm reading in third grade is what it, I'm teaching at the at the continuation high school and I went oh my gosh and that's it we need kids learning on grade level we need them to be inspired there math is another one that we need as well um, they need their basic foundation of adding and subtracting multiplying and dividing and then from there we have, um, they're ready for everything. And we need things in the high school level, vocational education, we need, I would love to move home and back. <laughs> um, um, our, um, there we go. Thank you. And lastly, we'll hear from Paula. The key issues that I generally hear a lot about have a great deal to do with it, attracting and retaining teachers. Teachers with proper credentials, teachers who can make a wage or have benefits taken care of at an appropriate level. And especially working conditions, it's like their atmosphere and how appreciated or valued they feel. Currently, there's about a 17% a year turnover in our staff Maybe two or three percent are retiring teachers, but there's over 10 percent that are people who are leaving, either because they're invited to go or there's something lacking in what they think they find in Willits. For me, that's major. There's also a 17 percent waiver list, which means we are hiring teachers that don't have all the proper credentials. I really think that that's a big issue, partially because I hear about it a lot but also because I always think things like that are important. The other thing that is really concerning to me is the lack of equity that we find for our students so that they can all go forward at a reasonable rate. And I also believe a lot in how important it is to make sure that education is our number one job. Thank you. So we are on to our next question. For a district the size of Willits, where size is determined by the number of enrolled students, the state mandates that the district must set aside money, put aside money in a reserve for economic uncertainty. Some, the required, the, the required, required amount that the district has to set aside is a formula, it's 3% of the general fund expenditures and other finances, financing uses. But basically it's 3% of the general fund expenses that has to be set aside in this reserve for economic uncertainty as mandated by the state. Some districts maintain just this 3% reserve. Some maintain a reserve as high as 20%. So the question, what do you think or believe is the optimum percentage amount the district should have in reserve, and why? How much should the district be setting aside in general as a percent? State mandated is 3%. Some districts go as high as 20%. And it's for economic uncertainty. So, first respondee will be Diane McNeil to be followed by Danye. Three 
3% is a reasonable amount. Um, if we have anything more than that, we can put it towards fixing um, and repairing equipment uh, facilities. We could, um, I know with policy, we can hire uh, teachers, qualified teachers. Um, we can um, get raises. They can get raises, teachers and, and uh, clerical staff as well. Um, 3% would be your bottom line. But everything else, if districts have 20, 30% in reserve or 12% in reserve, um, they have projects they want to do. And maybe that's what they're setting those for. Um, I can see one way, I know the county has seen us as low as one and a half percent here in Willits. Um, Willits has been in a slump. We did get the bypass. Um, people have not moved in the area as well. So as soon as we get ADA is where we get most of our money. If we can get our kids into the classroom, that'll be a wonderful thing. Thank you. Next we will hear from Donye to be followed by Chris Neary. <coughs> Hi. So to answer that question, I was going to have to research a little bit more as far as how 3% has been holding on for Willits, um, considering the fact that this high school is definitely in need of some repairs. And so, I mean, I would have to say that we really probably, if I do become a board member, we probably have to be something that has to be discussed. Um, like I said, I need to research that a little bit further to give you a complete honest answer. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, to be followed by Jeannie King. Well, my short answer would be 3% because that's what the state uh, sets as the optimum or, or the required uh, reserve. Our job is not to save the money that the state finances us with. Uh, our job is to uh, Take this district is funded by by the state. All districts are funded by the state. We don't raise money, um, so we just have to operate within the funds that are available to us from the state. And so, it, it, there are going to be times when there's economic uncertainties, but that's going to be felt across the state. Uh, but our, I don't think our job is to save money. Uh, for a rainy day, our job is to deploy the funding that's available to us from the state in the year that we receive it and maintain the required reserve of 3%. Thank you. Next, uh, we'll hear from Jeannie to be followed by Paul. I think that, uh, um, I think that the school district has a very good financial manager that the superintendent and the, um, and the board have been very uh, physically responsible. And our job is to educate children and to not save money, but to be physically responsible. And uh, I know that uh, the uh, County Office of Education checks each school district, their funds, to make sure that they're being responsible with their monies and that, uh, that the County Office of Education feels that Willits is doing a good job at that. And, uh, but there are financial uncertainties and um, uh, our job is to educate children, to hire good staff, to, um, to stay within our budget, to not spend more than we take in. But like any household, it's important to keep some money in reserve. And 3%, uh, uh, yes, and maybe a little bit more if we have a little bit more uh, financial leeway. Thank you. Thank you. Next Paula to be followed by Robert Chavez. Okay, well, currently it is true that the governor says we need 3%. There was a time with one and a half. However, our district, according to the recently discussed unaudited actual, says we have a little over 11% in our reserve. 
I truly do believe that that's way too much money for a reserve. I agree with our other two that, yes, if we have some sort of an emergency, it's probably throughout the state, and the state will come and, and cover it like they usually take care of all sorts of things. ADA, just as a little background, is the number of students, right? So if you get 1,500 students a year, the state will pay you for those 1,500. If the following year you have more, the state will pay you for more. If you have less, the state will still pay you what they paid you when you had 1,500. So you always have a year's buffer on how to figure out, do you or don't you have the ability to afford what you're doing? I believe that we have enough people in the district office to figure that out for us. 3% is fine. Anything above that is just depriving that current year's children of what they truly should be getting. Thank you. Next, uh, we'll hear from Robert, you followed by Bob. Okay, I'm gonna say something a little bit different, only from my experience. Um, quite honestly, in a perfect wor world, I would say 30%. And it'd be like any other person having 30% of a yearly income put away for you in case something happens. And I was around several years and at the district level when we had those cuts and it hurt. And there were a number, I'm talking several districts, I was in the Central Valley that went under. The state had to come in and took over the, the budgeting and how their money was to be spent because they did not have a reserve. Now, I said that's in a perfect world. In the real world, we have needs. We have needs to maintain our staff. We have needs uh, with facilities, and our children have needs. So I think any decision um, to increase that percentage really needs to be collaborative with all of the participants in the community. But when we can, I would say we need to uh, cushion that budget because right now I think maybe we can run the school if all of a sudden our, our, our finances stop, maybe a month, um, before we're in the red. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. Well, certainly we would want to uh, maintain our reserve within the state guidelines, but uh, we also may want to look at our reserve in terms of uh, cash flow. A lot of times the uh, the bills come in and maybe the money has not come from the state, so we may want to look at our reserve and have it higher than the state mandated amount. Thank you. Our next question. How do you respond to an upset parent who comes to see you? First to respond will be Robert Chavez to be followed by Paula Nunez. Well, uh, being an administrator for over 20 years, I've had that happen once or twice, <laughs> maybe three times. And quite honestly, uh, I was never upset, no matter how upset the parent was, because in truth, um, what I found, parents come to you because they love, they love their child, and they love that child more than anyone else in the whole world. <laughs> so they come with a good, a, a good heart. They're there for their child. And so as we respond, we need to respond in kind, that we care about your child and we want to make whatever the difficulty is or the complaint, we want to make it right for your child. So in understanding as administrator that we're all family, the parents, the child, the administrator, the school, the teachers, we're all one big family. When two, two of your own siblings or your, your own children come to you, and they have a concern or a problem or one, you try to make it better. You may try to make it better for everyone and maintain uh, the family relationship. Thank you. Next is Paula to be followed by Jeannie. Jeannie. Well, I have to continue with what um, Mr. Chavez said. That's exactly the way it always starts. However, I also very strongly believe that Lots of times people don't understand the system. They don't always understand that what is good for your child also needs to be available for everyone else's child. Often it's, it's an easy way out to say, well, we'll do this right now. But when the next child comes in with exactly the same issue, we don't do it exactly the same way. 
So I believe there needs to be a real sincere line of consistency when everyone, anyone, comes to complain about things, as well as in solutions, as well as if they're coming to me as a board member, what they want to know is why certain things are happening a certain way. And I need to be able to give them the background as to why it was set up, the opportunities to come to a public forum and explain exactly how they feel and why. And then I need to support them, if I can, with what I believe, and hopefully the community that elected me believed also. Thank you. Next, I'll hear from Jeannie, followed by Diane Neal. I uh, taught special ed for um, about 20 years, and what I found with parents is that uh, parents really want to be listened to. That's what's really important to them, is that they feel that they're listened to, and that, um, that someone cares about their child. And, um, and so I think that's really important, is to approach the parent with, with a listening ear, and uh, to be aware, and then to be aware of, and, and to hear what's really going on, and then to be aware of what options there are within the school district to support that parent, to support that student, and to um, um, to give the uh, the parents some direction and some support, and not just drop it there, but to continue interacting with that parent so that they feel that there's someone that is on their side and that, that cares about their uh, their child's well-being. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Diane, followed by Bob Colby. Um, yes, we've had parents come <laughs> into our classrooms, and the main thing is they do want to be listened to, and you need to listen and find out why, um, what their concerns are, and write those down, and have them um, understanding that you are listening to them. Um, once I finish with a parent talking, I would go to the principal and let them know that um, this, this parent came to see me and these were the issues that that parent had. And those are the protocols we have in the schools, is first you come talk to the teacher, and then if it's not resolved there, it goes to the principal. The principal will try something and then it goes to the superintendent. The superintendent's there as well, and if we have to come to a decision at the board, that's the next part. Those are things that are established, and that's how they work. Um, but the main thing is listen to that parent and listen to what they want to say. Thank you. <coughs> next, we'll hear from Bob Colby, followed by Don Yang. When I was working on my uh, counseling credential at the University of San Francisco, we spent a lot of time on uh, how to deal with parents who are upset. And uh, one thing that came out of those uh, training sessions um, was that listen to listen to what the parent's problem is and clearly identify what the problem is and then identify what steps can be taken to resolve the problem. So I think we said earlier that we're all part of a family and we are. And so we have a family member that's upset. We need to listen and then help solve that problem. Thank you. Danye, um, to be followed by Chris here. <laughs> well, I know this question all too well. Because I was an angry parent at one time. And I agree with pretty much everything that everyone has said in answer to this question. And one thing that really worked for me and made me feel calm as a parent was that um, things were followed up. They followed through with things. They called me, they said, hey, la la la, and this and that. And I said, oh, great, wonderful. And it continued until the matter was pretty much resolved. So I would have to say that pretty much everything here worked. 
And the following up and following through with that parent is very, very important. Okay. Last one, Chris Leary. Well, the first thing I would tell the angry parent uh, is, is first uh, that not to start the board member, uh, that the, the process is as was described uh, is to, to go to the teacher first, then to the uh, site administrator, and then to the superintendent. And if you're not satisfied after those three steps, you have an option to appeal to the board. Uh, and so it's, it's really inappropriate for a school board member to hear one side of the story uh, at the beginning before it goes through that process. But certainly, uh, I think it's the duty of the school board to hold the administrators accountable. And I, everyone here used the word listen, and I think that's the, 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 the key word for uh, dealing with parents who have uh, issues with, with, their, with their children interfacing with the school district. Uh, so I would say that if you go through that process and you don't feel that you've been listened to, that's the time to come to the board member and tell the board member you know, what the process was, where it failed, and then it's that's the place where the board intercedes. Thank you. Our next question, this is a hypothetical question. If, due to a windfall in unrestricted one-time funding from the state, the district's general fund in balance balance increased by a million dollars. <laughs> How would you recommend that this money be spent? First we'll hear from Chris Neary followed by Bob Kovic. I actually, uh, sometimes as I go to sleep think about that, <laughs> fantasize what we would do. Uh, and so I have, I, I think I, when I look around this auditorium, this auditorium was built in what, 1926, right after the high school burned on Pine Street. And this auditorium was a statement by the community that it was serious about education. You look at this, this is probably one of the best high school auditoriums in Northern California for a school this size. And I, it sends a message. And I think that the, the, one of the duties of the district the board, the administrators, and everyone, uh, the business administrators, to send the message that we want our facilities in, in first class condition. And so and that first million dollars would go straight to the uh, facilities bottom line. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Bob Colvin, followed by Paula Nunez. Well, a million dollars, it'd be nice to be able to share it with the entire family. Uh, but uh, we might want to set down some priorities and figure out if there's money available to share with uh, teachers and staff and then look at our facilities and try and uh, take that million dollars and make it a balanced expenditure. Thank you. Yes, Paula followed by Robert Chavez. Okay, yes, I would put about half of it probably on facilities. I'd like to start with all the little tiny things that are just a constant annoyance, like when the door doesn't lock when you shut it or the bathroom doesn't work because the pipe or the drain or whatever back flushes, so to speak. Anyway, those things would be real important to me for about the first half. The other half of the million dollars, I'm pretty certain I would put on things like student furniture, desks and chairs, certain types of equipment that people need, vacuum cleaners and brooms, oils, whatever it is to clean and make this nice facility stay looking nice. I like to see it put on things for students in particular, maybe even before the facility and the materials, just because those students bring the money and they should get the first chunk of the first windfall. Things for students like making sure that you can do some sort of computer checkout so that the kids that don't have those at home have access. Or more books, we do really well with that in the PTA at the elementary level. There are a number of things we could go on for a long while. 
Thank you. Next, Robert, what will be followed by Diane? The, uh, anytime you get a windfall like that, um, what I seem to be the best process is for all the shareholders in our school district to get together. There's probably already a few lists of things that need to be done out there, right? One or two lists out there. But what we would need to do is get together as a group with, with everyone else and, and prioritize items that need to be taken care of and then determine where those funds would fit in, what we could get taken care of um, that's most in need. Because it's, it's not only facilities, there's also personnel issues that may need to be taken care of. Um, there may be instructional needs out there. There's a lot of different needs out there. And the trick is, is to make that million dollars stretch as far as it will go and cover as many bases as possible. Thank you. Next is Diane, followed by Jimmy King. A million dollars. <laughs> um, um, we need to, add, I think the thing we need to do is ask the teachers, the administrators, what they need, the maintenance department, what they need, and prioritize that. Um, and ask what students want, too. Um, and as we said, let's, this is a blessing if we did. <laughs> uh, facilities especially, and then um, getting things done that have been put off for a lot of years. And then we need input from the community. What do they want to see as well um, for their kids? That's the main thing. Thank you. This is Jeannie to be followed by Daniel. <clears throat> I know that when Superintendent Westerberg was hired, he was asked to, um, to strengthen our weaknesses. And one of the things he sat down to do is he has a spreadsheet in which he has information on every school site and every maintenance product project that needs to be done. And, uh, and plus a cost estimate as to how much each of those um, projects would cost. Our newest school is Boston Lane, which is 30 years old, and we have a lot of maintenance. I know that uh, uh, we have less parking at the high school um, uh, because of the work that's been done on 101. There's so much to do, and there's no money in a regular school budget to do major updates and facilities. And we're not looking at building new facilities, we're looking at taking care of what we have. And uh, with a million dollars, I'm sure there would be money that we could help uh, teachers and help students to, um, to improve their classroom environment also, not just physically, but um, academically also. Thank you. And lastly, Daniel. Well, since I'm for students first, it's definitely going to be students first, and it's meet their needs so that they feel safe and comfortable coming to school. Um, and I think we definitely will have to look at the facilities because we all know our, st our schools are quite old. And if you ever try to sit at a bathroom at Brookside and you're a little bit taller than a child there, it's a little uncomfortable. That's all. Thank you. So our next question has been touched upon um, already tonight, um, but we'll extend, um, we'll extend this question. Nine years ago, the Willits voters passed a $43 million bond to fund an array of projects for the school district. After problems surfaced, at which point $14 million of the $43 million had been spent, a decision was made to cut off the bond and discontinue its funding. There are still numerous facility issues that remain. Would you promote putting forth another bond that solely targets fixing and repairing facilities in the district? Why or why not? And if yes, how would you promote passage of this bond? So first, responding would be 
Paula Nunez, followed by Robert Chavez. Okay, well, so I know how controversial this is. And I must tell you up front that no, I wouldn't support another bond. I was around for much too much of the last bond that we did. And its sole purpose in the beginning was to be to repair and replace problems and then go to building buildings. But instead that was turned around. And there wasn't enough money because people weren't understanding the costs of such a type of loan. I don't think a whole lot of things have changed. We had about 26% of the population vote for that election, and 14 or 15% voted for a bond, and that's what we've all been paying in one way or another since then. I truly believe there are other alternatives we need to study a little more seriously first. There is money from the state, you have to learn how to ask for it. And we also have a, just a tremendous maintenance department now that's larger than we've had in over 20 years. And I believe that they have the skills, or I would imagine that they have the skills to do the majority of the work that needs to be done. We need to work on them first. Thank you. That's Robert, who's followed by Diane. I, my time hasn't started yet. Has no. <laughs> um, I, like I said, I've been in, I've been in, gosh, five different districts working at the district level and so forth. I've had the opportunity to observe a lot of bond measures, and not just my district, but sort of neighboring districts. What I found uh, with bond issues that that become negative is usually one of two things: either it was mismanaged. Or uh, the economy changed. I've seen bond measures go down because the price of building went way high, went sky high. That could happen here easily if we had a big fire. All of a sudden, you know, those contractors are, or you're paying a lot more money for a building than you would before. However, I've also seen bond measures do amazing things. I was in uh, the district that I was uh, area superintendent in. Uh, we multiplied our bond measure, and, and instead of getting one school, we get three by finding matching funds. And we were a growing district, and we did some amazing things for those bond issues. So in saying all that, what I have come to learn is, if you want anything substantially done in your district, and although there are there is other funding out there, it'll never match the amount of money you get up front in a bond, and it would be necessary for us to go for a bond if we want some of these things fixed. Next is Diane to be followed by Daniel. Uh, school bonds. Um, I was, yeah. <laughs> school bonds, I heard people when they heard that we were thinking of getting a school bond in 2012, um, said they would not vote for it. There's still the mismanagement that happened here has really um, tarnished the reputation of the school board. Um, and mm, I think it was a promise of $26 would be increased to our taxes, and it's mine is up to $89 a year I pay for the bond that will be paid off in 2041. And that's really hurting a lot of people in Willits. I know there's um, things at the state we could look into. Like Robert said, there's matching funds on some things. And I think that's what we need to look at. And we need to get more information on this. I don't think we had enough information in the 2010 bond issue that took us under. Plus, we had a decrease of enrollment of 4% of that really economically hurt us really bad. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Don Gay, followed by Chris Neary. So I can. Right now, I'm not going to say yes or no on the bond. And the reason why that is because I believe there needs to be detailed research. 
on this issue. We need to have some data. We need to know, we have, need to have criteria necessary to analyze the full impact that the, the existing bond has put upon our community. You know, I mean, I live in the home that I'm in right now. I'm a renter. I've been in that home for 15 years. And in the first, excuse me, since the existing bond has been passed, my rent has went up twice. Twice. Never before, only after the bond. I'm now paying over $100 more than I paid before the bond. So it does have some impact. Do we know the full impact? I'm not sure we even have that information. Um, so I would really, really have to research um, something like this. Because it does impact our entire community as well as our children. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Chris to be followed by Bob Coley. Well, I'd be totally against any bond if, if we had a hypothetical million dollars every six months or so. <laughs> but I don't think we're going to receive that. Now. So I think it's the the duty of the board to at least explore means to provide the necessary facilities and the maintenance of the facilities. And that, as Danielle suggested, requires a lot of research and, and, and attention. And I, so I think that's what the, where we are now. We're actually committing ourselves to that investigation. The important thing is to involve the community in the process as we go along and you know, it's ultimately the community's decision, not ours. The community either says yes or no. But uh, the 2010 bond was doomed for failure uh, because of the economic crash in 2008. It takes a couple of years for the assessed valuation to uh, to, to reflect the, the reduction of, of uh, assessed valuation. We had a precipitous drop in assessed valuation uh, it was down to $850 million. Today, it's about a billion two. Uh, uh, so that really was the, the problem with the 2010 bond. It was beyond the control of the people who were in the Thank you, Miss. We'll hear from Bob, followed by Judy King. Well, I think we, uh, we need to be proactive in our efforts to improve our school facilities. Superintendent Westberg has prepared a list of projects and their estimated costs. We need to make that list available so that uh, the community can see the types of projects that we're talking about. The funds to uh, complete those projects, there's not enough money in the general fund. So where are we going to get the, the money to fund those projects? And uh, certainly a bond measure needs to be part of the discussion. but. Uh, we need to ask our community for support uh, to improve our school facilities and ask for ideas that uh, is workable within the community. Thank you. Lastly, we'll hear from Jeannie King. A bond is not something to go into lightly and it would require a lot of community input and a lot of um, careful thought. But I know that within a school district budget, not only will it spend any school district budget, there is not the money to make significant <coughs> improvements in, in the facilities. And because of the age of our buildings, our buildings need considerable um, help at this point. And I know that uh, uh, Superintendent Westerberg has this spreadsheet in which he has, he's gotten input from throughout the school district's maintenance people, teachers, administrators as to what needs to be done at each school site. He's prioritized those, he's figured, uh, gotten estimates as to how much they would cost. And so there is that information there. Uh, uh, and I know that the school district has also been working very hard about making the changes that they can. There was a partnership with the, with the um, Howard Foundation to replace the broiler uh, or the heater on, for, the, for, the, um, for the swimming pool. And we're using the construction class to do some small improvements. Uh, so, and the maintenance. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Next question. Is another hypothetical. 
If the district's multi-year budget projections indicated that the district needed to make $300,000 in budget cuts next year, what might you, as a board member, recommend? Would you like it repeated? <laughs> if the district's multi-year budget projections indicated that the district needed to make $300,000 in budget cuts next year, what might you, as a board member, recommend? First, we will hear from Donye, be followed by Jeannie. I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? <laughs> sure. If the district's multi-year budget projections so multi-year, we have our current year adopted budget and then two years beyond that. Multi-year projection. If it indicated that the district had to make $300,000 in budget cuts next year, not the current year, but next year, what might you as a board member recommend? Well, that's a pretty hard question, I'll have to say, because I've been through many, many budget cuts and they weren't all nice. So, first of all, I'm gonna just have to say that I couldn't completely answer that question for you guys right now. I would have to definitely take a look at what, let's say, I'm going back to keep the cuts far away from the classroom as possible, and that's all I'm gonna say right now, thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Jeannie King, followed by Bob Cole. Since we'd be looking at a couple of years out, I would, um, uh, as a board member, I would try to see how we could maybe um, um, set aside monies from the two budgets that preceded that so that there was more money in that third year. And I would also, uh, like Danny mentioned, uh, try to keep the budget cuts as far away from um, the classroom as possible. And. Um, but at the same time, I think that we could uh, maybe not um, buy new curriculum, but use the curriculum we have. Those kinds of expenditures that, um, that um, we have good staff that knows how to teach. And uh, that maybe that particular weird year we don't need to buy new curriculum. So that one might be a place to, to look at. So thanks. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Bob, followed by Paula Nunez. Well, I've uh, been through that type of process, budget cut process, several times in my career, and uh, it's always tough, but you compile a list of possible cuts, uh, input from everyone in the educational community and the local community, and you try and make sure that the uh, proposed cuts that you're examining have a minimal effect on students in their classroom. And it, it sometimes gets very heated, but uh, you have to have all the, the stakeholders uh, have some input into if we're going to cut back, where we're going to cut back, and the logic behind making those cutbacks. So it has to be a group activity. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Paula, followed by Robert Chavez. Well, I was involved in the last 10 years ago when we were doing serious budget cuts and had a number of committees and did all the rest of that. I wouldn't think we completely need to go through all of that again. I do agree with Anya that it needs to be as far away as possible from the classroom. What I also believe is that you need to start at the top of the most expensive people in the district when you cut people because cutting one of them makes a major difference in that $300,000 before cutting five or six that are making 30 grand a year instead of 100 and a half. The other thing I would really make sure of is that I would have thoroughly gone over the unaudited actuals one more time so that there weren't any little spaces where somebody had more money than initially budgeted. And then the point about, I, I may have misunderstood you, I thought it was the second year out if it's the third year out, 
I wouldn't pay any attention at all. The third year actual, you know, projected actuals are always wrong. They have never ever been correct. But if it's the second year, then yeah, you'd have a whole year of a higher student count, trusting that the drop became a reason because of lower ADA. Then I'd start there. Thank you. Next we have Robert, followed by Chris Neary. Uh, I believe everyone has, has voiced uh, what I would do already. Uh, I've gone through this also. And what we did is we identified all the items we could possibly cut, you know, increasing class size plus other items, supplemental items, extracurricular items, I mean everything, uh, workforce and so forth. We, we also identified if we cut that, how much we would save uh, for the coming years. And, and then we took it out to the community and we talked to everybody in the community, we went to about 20 different schools and had community meetings. We had, um, of course, staff meetings, and and uh, uh, we had uh, also meetings for uh, like the city and so forth. We had all kinds of input, and then um, and then we made a decision. It, it was tough, but I will have to say we kept it away from the classroom, which was what our mantra was and keep the programs for the kids and we kept our band and our, our sports programs when everyone else was dropping them. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Chris followed lastly by Diane. <laughs> First of all, it's not a hypothetical question. Every year our budget shows that the third year out there's going to be at least $300,000 deficit or at least it has been that way in the last five years. Um, so I agree with Paula that, that that third year out is virtually based on assumptions and that, that really are a whole series of assumptions which may or may not occur. Uh, so I would not start cutting uh, if you saw the third year out there was going to be a deficit. Uh, the, the second year, uh, projection is interesting because you have to make sure that your current spending level isn't causing a structural problem the upcoming year. That's the, 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 the main goal of, of looking at the second year. Uh, but after that, uh, the board really um, doesn't have um, uh, much discretion in spending. Uh, about 80% uh, is for uh, salaries for, for teachers and administrators. So about 20% of our budget is, is basically the discretionary income. And it's a $300,000 cut is Thank hard you. every single time. Thank you. And lastly, we'll hear from Diane McNeil. Willits has um, done this before. <laughs> and we had to do cuts. And it is. Um, we look at different committees. We formed different committees and we wanted to keep it away from the classroom as far as possible. Um, classroom sizes did become bigger. Um, the, we did take cuts, teachers even took cuts, uh, but every committee has, to, the teachers have to agree to something, um, maintenance, everything. Um, and the community wants their input as well. Um, and what we'll do is see what happens. It was really hard for three years to get, or five years to get back on some of that cuts that we had before in the looks as well. Thank you. And the last question from our prepared questions from the sponsors is how would you make yourself available for interaction and or communication with any and all stakeholders in the community? How would you make yourself available for interaction and or communication with any and or all stakeholders in the community? So first we'll hear from Robert to be followed by Paula. The uh, position of a board member is, uh, it's, since you are the voice of the community, it's very important, of course, that you are available. Um, I do have two daughters who are going to school here. One's at Sherwood, one's at Blossom Lane. I'm also the Otters coach. 
Um, so I interact with many of the parents through those three venues. Um, I'm also visible throughout the community and speak to many others. Um, I've known quite a few people, I know quite a few people now who would have no problem with coming to me and telling me what they, they think. Um, I've also worked, uh, I've worked here in Willits and of course and I teachers and administrators that I've worked with that also come to me. Um, we, it may come to the point, we'd have to talk to uh, our superintendent and other board members where we actually have our email address available. Most people know how to get to it anyways where we're able to get that information. Um, with the technology now, it's not too difficult to get to board members and we are available. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Paula followed by Jeannie King. Well, I usually am very accessible also. I was president of the association for teachers for a couple of years, or four, I guess, but at different times. Anyway, and I've always had a real open door policy. I don't know anybody that can't figure out how to get a hold of me by way of email, Safeway, down the street, wherever. I firmly believe, however, that board members need to go and see all school sites. They need to spend time, make it a second Wednesday of each month where you're at a particular site. Teachers have access to you. People have access to you. I mean, truthfully, our number one job, besides our other number one jobs, is to represent the community. And if they can ever reach you, or they don't feel welcome at board meetings, you won't ever find out what they have to say. You'll only hear through the back door all the things they don't like that goes on. So in my mind, it's really important. I'm real visible, hard to miss. And you know, all you have to do is call. In the past, I used to put up my name and and um, email address, and when it wants to, gets to drop by. I explain, you don't always get agreement, but you definitely get an ear. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Judy King, called by Diane McNeil. Uh, as an elected uh, board member, it's very important to be accessible not only to the community in which um, I'm serving, but also within the schools. And I know my sister who lives, lived in Dallas, she would come to Willits and she said, would say, how do you know so many people? And that's just what a small community is, you know people. And um, uh, if someone approaches you in a store or something, I was in brick, the Brick House the other day and, and somebody wanted to tell me something they knew, they knew I was running for school board and they wanted to tell me something about how they felt children learned best. So I sat there and listened because it was important People need to be heard, and not only members of the community and parents, but also staff needs to be heard, and I think it is really important to be seen at the schools and to, uh, for the staff at the schools um, to feel that you uh, offer a listening ear and that you have their best interests in heart, at heart. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Diane, followed by Bob Coleman. Getting out in the community, going to the farmer's market. <laughs> uh, Bullets is, has the amazing people that you'll see. And they come up to you and they start talking. I see that you're running for school board and they'll give their opinion and they want to know about the concerns that we have. Um, there's also um, the library. When you attend the library, people come up. Um, so getting out there, and then as a school board member, I, um, other school board members, they have, um, the website shows their email address and you can always put a comment there and they'll get a hold of you. You need to be accessible. We need to hear what you're saying and uh, listen to what you have to say. And that's the most important thing. We want to hear what you want, um, what your concerns are and how we can help you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Bob, followed by Danielle Laurent. Well, our, uh, as a board member, our email address is on the district website, and I frequently get uh, uh, questions and concerns from uh, community members via that method. I, I try and go to as many school functions as possible at all the schools and go to the open houses, and, uh, and that's one way to, to be available to members of the community 
and jokingly, I'd say, uh, spend a lot of time at Safeway. Thank you. Next up, Darnay, followed by Chris Neary. Well, first off, I would make myself visible. I would get out, I would meet students, I would meet parents, I would talk to teachers, I would talk to employees of the district. One thing I would also do that I had asked, I don't, I'm not sure, I don't think I mentioned that I held many positions in this school district um, on salary basis. And I have asked board members in the past to walk a day in the shoes of the employees, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a cafeteria worker, um, any one of the people that work with your children on a daily basis. And it's important that we know exactly the job that they do, and they're very important jobs because without the staff, and the employees of this district, you couldn't open or close the school. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Chris Neary. I sit by a, at a desk all day with a telephone, old-fashioned landline, about a foot away from me. So I'm accessible by phone, and my staff puts through calls that, that I receive on school board business. Uh, I'm also uh, in an office downtown. People stop by from time to time, and. We always try to fit them in. Um, it's not always possible. It might be in, in a meeting, but I, I also think that you know, as pointed out, the email addresses are available, and th those email uh, inquiries are 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 probably the best because I can forward the email to the appropriate administrator, uh, and I and I've done that on, on many occasions. So um, I encourage anybody to reach me at any time um, uh, and uh, I, I think that I'm you, you will find me that about 10 hours a day at my office and, and uh, uh, you can contact me at your pleasure thank you so at this point we would would like to take a short five minute break just to stand up and stretch if you need to use a restroom Go out the left doors and directly across the hallway, and then, then we'll return and um, hear the questions from the audience. Some pretty interesting questions that I see from my head. Thank you.
questions. Reduce 
student distraction and improve academic performance. Would you support considering a ban on the use of mobile phones on school campuses? First, we'll start with Diane McNeil, followed by Diane. Okay, could we have the question again? Sure. Research indicates that mobile phone bans on school campuses reduce student distraction and improve academic performance. Banning mobile phones. Would you support considering a ban on the use of mobile phones on school campuses? I've seen those little charts, the charts, pocket charts, and I've seen students come in and put their phones there while the class is going on. They turn them off, and yes, the, they know where their phones are, and they're a distance away. <laughs> and I notice academics go up amazingly. And um, sometimes the parent wants to call their kid during the day, and they should know what the schedule is when your child is out of class or in between classes, but not during class. And you, they can leave a text, and it's fine. But the students can see those in those little pockets. Just put your phone there, and it's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Next is Donnie, followed by Chris Murray. Personally, I don't have a phone, and I'm not distracted. But any distraction that will take our, the students away from their learning is definitely something we need to look at. I'm not 100% sure about a ban, but I'm definitely um, sure that we need to improve student achievement and less distractions in the classroom as possible. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Chris, followed by Jeannie King. Obviously, uh, access to phones during the academic uh, process is not going to work and uh, you know so I think that there has to be regulations in place but I think it can be done on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. Uh, I think that we should treat phones as contraband. Um, just a few minutes ago I received a phone call from my wife wanting to know where I am. <laughs> and uh, so uh, it, it, uh, I, very few people have my cell phone number. So I, I think that it's a matter of common sense, but I, certainly not a one-size-fits-all ban. I, I would not support it. Thank you. Next, Jeannie King, followed by Paula. Technology is a wonderful tool, but it's also um, something that uh, keeps us from being present in what's really going on in our life, and I think it's really important for schools, for, schools, for teachers uh, to help students to stay focused on their, on their work and their academics and uh, their peers that are around them at that time, and um, that uh, that's, that's our responsibility. When they go out into the work world, they're not going to be able to be on their phones all the time, and that's what we're preparing them for. So I think it's really important to manage that, and I'm sure there's lots of ways to, to manage that, some sort of collection site when the student comes into the, into the uh, classroom in which their phone goes in. So, thanks. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Paula, followed by Robert Chavez. Well, I agree with Diane and Jeannie and everyone else who thinks that they don't have their place in your pocket or at your desk while you're in class. I, I do believe there should be kind of a one-size-fits-all type, though, in that no one needs their phone in the classroom. Every single classroom in our district has a telephone. Every single office in our, in our district has a secretary. And if there's an emergency, I really think it's appropriate to go ahead and call the office who calls your class who sends your child to go find out the emergency, which is disruption enough. And not that that's a bad thing, I mean, there are emergencies. 
The flip side is, you can have your phone back when you go outside. You have 10 minutes or seven or whatever to get from one room to the next. You have a whole lunch, you have a whole break. If you're really into your social stuff, then that's what you need to really be into, apparently. Take care of that, but not while you're in class. Your job in a classroom is to study what you have the opportunity to learn and take advantage of it. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Followed by Bob Colby. Uh, I believe that phones, like all technology, uh, with our smartphones now, they're here. They're here to stay, and they're part of life. And and uh, even though most adults have phones now, and it's part of their life. Uh, it would be hard to do a ban all, of, all, all across the board. I believe, like others, there can be constructs, rules placed in the classroom to keep the kids from using them. But it, it also has become a big part of our safety net for our children to contact them. And uh, God forbid if, if you're ever in a situation where it becomes a real emergency uh, problem, like a live shooter on, on campus, and a lot of calls go out uh, to help uh, and uh, intervene for those children. So it is a safety factor also. I keep the phones just not on in the classrooms. Thank you. Last thing, Bob. I think I'd advocate following a policy of common sense, keep the phones turned off in the classroom. Thank you. Next audience question. If a group of parents took offense at a book in the school library that portrayed a worldview at odds with your personal values, what would you do? Anyone need it repeated? Okay. Let's start with Paula, followed by Robert. Um, I, I really do believe that there are a number of things that are offensive to a number of people. And I also believe that just because what offends me doesn't necessarily mean it either offends you or that it needs to be kept away from my neighbor. I also strongly believe that my children are mine first and I loan them to you to educate and do whatever should be done to them. But in the final analysis, even though some days it seems like they're away from the house more than they're in it, I believe I have a larger influence. Consequently, if a book comes up that I don't like, I believe it's my responsibility to explain that I don't care for that book, I don't care to have my family exposed to that book, but it belongs right in the book section <laughs> so that anyone else who has a view different than mine has the right to deal with it and make that decision themselves. Thank you. Next, Robert, followed by Diane. The, uh, I, I do not see myself coming to a book where I would, I would say, uh, maybe I did share my values. I, I think in, in our society and in the educational system, to the extent that it's not a detriment to children, that we're here to grow minds and expand minds. Um, however, the only time I would really address a book it would be if I felt it was detrimental to the students in some way, in which case then there are ways to address that. And you know, you would forward it to the principal, hey, you need to look at this and, and let the, uh, the principal, the school community, and in our community determine if that book is uh, appropriate for our children. Thank you. This is Diane, followed by Diane. Um, I love books. <laughs> and if the parents, four or five, um, I think they have a right to say they don't want this book, but if they can find a book that's similar to the content that we need to teach the, ch the children in that, the moral message that's being sent through there, then that's one way to go. Um, also, the district does have policies that um, says, you know, it needs to be a books need to be reviewed by the parents as well to make sure that they know what the curriculum is. And we need to follow that as well. So just find a book that's similar to it and 
get the same message across. And there's, that should do it. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Donye, followed by Chris. I read and no one else reads. There might be a book that everyone reads and I don't read. It's just important to have all types of literature available to anybody and everybody that wants to seek knowledge from that type of writing. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, followed by Bob Colby. First of all, uh, with a cumulative uh, number of years on the board, I've been, I don't know, it's about 16 or 17 years. Uh, the issue doesn't come up very often. We don't hear complaints about books. Our textbooks go through a review process where we have to adopt them uh, through a public hearing where we make the textbooks available prior to uh, a, a school board meeting and then we hold a public hearing and we receive comments from the public as to whether you know, if there's any complaints or views as to the, the books that are being used. And we, we, we hold those hearings maybe three or four times a year, and I can't remember anyone ever coming and saying anything uh, about any textbook. As for books in the library, you know, the library is a marketplace for ideas, and you know, that if, if there's some people that don't like a certain book, then just don't read it. Thank you. Next, Bob, and followed by G. I think what I would do is just uh, listen to the, the parents' uh, complaint and then uh, go from there. I think you'd have, have more discussion on what that question is sharing with us. Thank you. Lastly, Jim. We live in a culture in which a lot of people are easily offended. and. Um, I, there's uh, the textbook uh, process in how to in, in which the textbooks are reviewed and that's part of the uh, public input and I know that at the, the, the grade level each grade level has grade level meetings the high school has and middle school have department uh, meetings and that uh, it would be the place in those meetings to bring those kinds of concerns of a parent is if it was being a, a, a book that was being read as a class project, as a class book. But uh, what is, you know, um, what's in the library, somebody doesn't have to read it. But if it's being inst used in instruction, then I think it's up to the, um, the, the grade level or the, um, or the um, de department in the middle school and the high school to talk about. Well, what might be an alternative book or how they might work without parent. So, Thank you. Next question. Would you support implementing a rich computer science program including coding and robotics in our district? Uh, first to respond will be Chris Neary followed by Bob. Well, as you read that question, I was hoping I wouldn't be the first one to have to answer. Uh, could you read the question again? So I, didn't, I don't sure. think I understood it. Would you support implementing a rich computer science program, including coding and robotics in our district? Well, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, uh, so uh, I think I will say that the curriculum doesn't start the school board, it starts with the teachers and the administrators, and to a certain extent, even the parents. Um, so I, I, uh, I would support, if, uh, if, if there's new technology that needs to be integrated into the uh, curriculum, I'd support you know, doing that, to, you know, as a, but I don't see where that kind of uh, adjustment to the curriculum would, would originate with the board. Thank you. Bob, followed by Paula. Uh, 
follow with what Chris is saying. Uh, certainly we'd like to have new programs and we'd like to expand the programs that, uh, up to the robotics level or, or coding in, in the area of computers, but it has to start within the school and, and see if there's demand for that program and, and parent input also. Thank you. All followed by Robert. Okay, well, so my idea of coding and robotics doesn't seem to fit the conversation so far. So maybe I don't know what it is. But what I think I know that it is, I wouldn't expect that we'd need very much coding or robotics in our classrooms at this particular level. You could get exposure, you could learn about the laws, and you could learn about maybe how to do it a little bit. But I'm not sure it has to have its place in our high school. I could see it more advanced, but I'm not sure it would be long here. Thank you. Robert, followed by Diane. If we had a staff member that would be able to spearhead that, because that's where you'd have to start, we had someone who had that background, that knowledge base to pass that on to your kids, I'd say, heck yeah. I went to a, uh, well, uh, one district I worked in, we did have a robotics program. They did code it. They had big competitions. In fact, one of them, I kicked off the whole competition, and they had competitions from all over, all over the world. I mean, we had people coming in from other countries with their robotics team, and they had a task, and they competed against each other. It was amazing. So if we had a staff member that could spearhead that, and then we start getting the support, heck yeah, I'd say it'd be fantastic for these kids. Thank you. Diane, followed by Jeannie. Coding and robotics sounds like an after-school program. <laughs> um, Odyssey of Mind does those, and I was an Odyssey of the Mind coach. And coding is starting as early as four-year-olds. Four and um, girls need to get involved with that as well. And that's what the coding is for. Um, when I thought about typing, you know, how you work on your computer, and when you do that shift, there are other buttons on there, and that's the coding part of it. I had to learn that. And I'm, so it's learning more technology and what they mean. And I think we need an after-school program or something that to get kids involved in that. Um, the robotics is amazing. You can start with just um, batteries and Legos, and then move up from there. And kids, it's a fantastic way to use what you're using in the classroom and them implementing it in, in the outside world and see what they're doing. It's amazing. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, Jeannie, to be followed by Danielle. Vocational education is not called vocational education anymore. It's called uh, career technical education. Uh, and uh, it's referred to as CTE, career technical education. And I think that there's 12 strands of career technical education that are recommended um, by the state or that are encouraged by the state. We have eight career technical, uh, technical education strands, I believe, at the high school which I think is pretty awesome for a small school district. And uh, I think it's our responsibility to prepare our students as much as possible for the world that they are going to face, which is a world which has a lot of technology in it. But I don't think that, uh, we don't live in Silicon Valley where those kinds of uh, skills are readily available in our community. And if the money is available, uh, then we could look at that. But. Uh, um, it's, um, there's other things we can do too, so thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Danielle. Uh, well, I, if it's what the students want, so we have students that are interested in that type of stuff and enough are involved. Um, I, I think it's something that we definitely have to look at as board members. I would have to um, ditto on Chavez over here about someone spearheading something like that because I'm sure that's absolutely what we're going to need. So if it's what the students want, then we will have to listen. Thank you.
Thank you. Next question. In what ways has high stakes testing impacted students and teachers in the district? In what ways has high stakes testing impacted students and teachers in the district? Um, we'll start with Bob, followed by Diane. I think in order to properly answer that question, we'd have to find out from the teacher where we are in the 2018 version of high stakes, high stakes testing. You know, when when I was a counselor, we did the high school ex exam, and that was a lot of stress in people's lives. And so I'd want to know, uh, you know, qualify that question. What what are we talking about, and what's the 2018 version? Thank you, Diane. Followed by Diane. I need to know the definition for high test, high stakes testing. Is that the? I don't have anything more than what was written on this card. Okay. <laughs> so if it was the standard testing that we have in May um, that I've gone through doing the fourth grade testing, kids need to know the computer technology that goes with that test. Um, it's different than, um, you know, highlighting a letter or doing it that way. There's um, different ways to do the math. There's different ways for the kids to learn um, highlighting the information on a text that they need. So first you need the technology part, at least go to the computer lab once a week and teach your kids how to use those techniques so they can be more successful in taking the test. Thank you. Next, Donye, to be followed by Chris. Hi. Yes, I believe any testing can be stressful and have high anxieties. I think the first and most important thing is that um, as educators, our, as once the child leaves the home and comes into our school, that we're recognizing that as this child has they eaten, they look rested, you know, um, there's a lot of factors that we need to take into account. Just so you know, a little bit of the school bus driver, I used to get children on my bus, oh my God, it's testing, and I haven't ate anything, and, and, I'm not, and I haven't slept. And so there's a lot of anxiety that go with testing, and I think just preparing them. I know when I was, First in college, um, my professor did a lot of quizzes. Quizzes are actually really good because of the fact that they prepare the student so that when they're there to take that test, it's not so overwhelming because they know these little quizzes and so they have an idea and they're somewhat prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Chris to be followed by G. I don't view testing as, as the end all of our academic program, uh, but certainly our test scores have been trending down, uh, even in relation to our standing among other schools in this county. Uh, so I think that test scores are important only to show you the general trends, and, and it's, it's really not uh, our, certainly, we should, our emphasis shouldn't be on having students do well on the test. Our, our goal is to have our students take the test and to reflect that they've achieved academic success. So I, I, I'm not sure what high stakes testing is. I mean, if, if that's, if that's a, 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 a name of a certain type of test, I don't know what it is. If it's high stakes, uh, all tests are high stakes. I, I, I have a recurring nightmare that that the state bar requires lawyers to take the bar exam every five years. <laughs> and believe me, I have it about a couple times a year. Uh, so testing is very stressful. It's not only stressful on the students, but it's stressful on the teachers. Thank you. Jeannie, followed by Paula. The, 
the way that I think of high stakes tests is that the whole curriculum of the school year is centered around preparing kids to score well on that particular test. And I, uh, I have, besides my special ed credential and a master's degree, I also have a degree in Waldorf education, and I believe children should be educated in their head, in their heart, in their hands. And that that's uh, uh, ultimately what's really important is that we educate children who are whole human beings. And uh, I think that uh, testing is just one part of that. I, I still, in my memory bank, remember taking state tests when I was in elementary school in the cafeteria of my elementary school. They're, they've been around forever, but that's not the end all and be all of our education system, or shouldn't be. Thank you. Paula, followed by Robert. I pretty much agree with everything that's been said. I, I do think that it's got some real negatives to it when we put so much emphasis on test scores and testing. Too many teachers believe that the biggest part of their, or a big chunk of their time should be spent teaching to the test. It is really important that you remember that a child is a whole being and you need to hit all their parts. However, I, I do like testing, especially, well, partially for reflection, but especially for showing a year's growth. I really do believe that to the best of everyone's ability, there needs to be at least one year's growth in every child every year. And if you can do that, that's a really good thing. Now, naturally, it doesn't happen all the time, partially because it cannot, but that is what a test should really be its best judge of. And the, the positives, I guess if you start them at preschool or you give them constant quizzes, they'll quit being worried about how worried they are about taking a test. Thank you. Lastly, Robert. The state standardized testing uh, Throughout my career, actually, I, I was there for the full pendulum swing, and it's 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 much like a double-edged sword in that um, there were some teachers that were not teaching enough content and academics, and it helped them rise. But on the other end, I've seen some beautiful, great teachers be stifled because they have to follow this high stakes testing. It is the game, whether we like it or not. There's so much funding that's tied to it and, and uh, negativity on it. Um, so we do have to play the game. However, uh, I, in reflecting on my career, I'll have to say that I have seen it stifle some really creative, creative, beautiful teachers. Thank you. And the last question for me, before we hear our, our candidates' closing statements, is how do you define success for our students? And first we'll hear from Judy King, followed by Chris Neary. Well, I think that we um, determine what is successful for our students as to how they do when they graduate from high school. I was a special ed teacher all those years, and I have students that did terribly on state testing that do not do well on the uh, essays they had to write, but they are now employed with Thurston and make really good money as very good mechanics. And to me, that is what a successful student is, is one that can move from the academic um, platform of the school and, uh, and find success in, um, in uh, being able to uh, be employable, and uh, and by being employable, they can also uh, take care of their families and be constructive members of the community. And um, that, to me, is how what a successful student is. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Chris, followed by Robert. I would not place 
total emphasis on power expectations or definition of success for students, I would rather <coughs> place some or maybe even a, a big part of the uh, definition on the student's view of their success. That our, I think our goal is to graduate students who feel that they are prepared uh, to enter into the, the workforce and their community as adults uh, with confidence that they have the skills uh, necessary to do that. And, and obviously learning is not going to stop when you graduate. But I think the emphasis should, I think every student who graduates should feel that they've been uh, uh, provided with the skills necessary to succeed and that they have confidence in themselves. Thank you. Robert, to be followed by Bob. Uh, I'm in a line with Mr. Neary. Um, the success for each child is, is different depending on their, their dreams, and not just their dreams, but also what their family dreams for them. There are basic skills that they need, reading, writing, math, um, and more importantly, being able to, to uh, think, critically think. But in the end, success for our, our kids is determined by their dreams and their vision. Thank you. Well, I think for uh, all of our children that come to school, we want them to be happy, healthy, safe, and we want them to want to come to school. And uh, on the on the final end, we want to make sure that they are competent in their mathematics and reading and writing, and have the ability to think critically. Thank you, Danielle. Are you followed by Diane? Okay, so I would have to agree on some things Neri and Mr. Chavez has stated, because success is to each and every, but it's the individual itself is successful. Every one of us are successful in something or another, but not the same thing. So I think it is gonna be based on the student and how, they, how well they feel prepared and responsible to enter the world as an adult. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Diane, and followed lastly by Paul. Um, as students, when they graduate from high school, they started at kindergarten or all the way through. They set their goals for that year, what they want to do from one year to the next. And it's like seeing them learn the alphabet or learning their math or finally getting algebra done, um, performing in a play. Um, that makes them successful. You look at the whole child um, when they come in and you um, see what they want. You ask them what their goal is for this year. What do you want to do? And they feel successful. And when you see them pick the new student out that day that comes and be their friend, will be their friend for the day, and that goes for the next six years until they graduate or whatever, that's what makes um, students wonderful here. And when they um, join groups and uh, get their friends involved, and um, it's amazing when you see how much that child grow, grew as a human, oh, not a human, but just somebody you want in your community. Thank you. And last thing we'll hear from Paul. So the plus about being last this time is that all I have to say is I agree with everybody here. And then my last own stuff is my idea of people being successful is if they're relatively socially acceptable, they can take care of themselves and contribute to society, and then also that they have at least some opportunities for feeling really happy since nobody gets it all the time. And I'm, I'm pretty certain that's all, but add to that everything I wanted to say that they said already. Thank you. So before we hear the candidates' closing statements, I want to, to say for all of us, thank you for um, 
spending the time to come here and share your thoughts and vision with all of us. We really appreciate it. And thank you to all the audience uh, members also for caring enough to want to learn, learn more about something so vital and important to our community as a school board. So for our closing statements, keeping with our randomness, we will hear from Paula Nunez first. <laughs> Okay, well, this is why I want to be a school board member, I guess, is appropriate enough, because all the little notes I made where I didn't finish my sentences, they don't matter. What you really need to know, please, is that I really do believe that I have enough understanding and empathy, certainly enough sincerity and ability to listen <laughs> on a lot of good news, to everything that I need to know about for the school board. I've already been really involved in it. I've held a variety of positions throughout the community that show, yeah, I know how to follow directions, take notes, and take care of business. I'm definitely opinionated, and I, um, I truly believe that I understand just about every single position in a school district, partially because I've fulfilled those positions, or filled those positions, not fulfilled. Um, in the past, except as I said earlier, I haven't been a superintendent. I have not driven a bus, but I've driven a bunch of school vans, and I've been a secretary and a custodian and everything else that's involved when I used to set up the summer programs. I, I really do believe I have good enough connections throughout the community to, to have enough trust by others that they can come talk to me and that I'll do the best I can to make sure their voices are heard. And other than that, just vote for me, please. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Robert, followed by Diane. Um, you know, throughout my career, in education, um, when we had really tough decisions, the people I worked with would always look at each other and then we'd ask ourselves, what's best for children? And all of a sudden that hard decision really wasn't that hard because it's very easy to say what's best for children. And I was just telling somebody out in the hallway, if I stop asking myself that when I'm making my decisions, then I need to hang it up and walk away. Well, I'm not there yet. I'm still here for what's best for children. And I just want to extend my appreciation to the Willits community um, for allowing me to serve this long, and I hope they allow me to serve longer. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Diane McNeil, followed by Diane Durant. I've worked in the, um, I have volunteered in the community and in, stood up to be a coach. And um, when I was with the Willits Otters, I moved up to being an official and on the board as well for starting a secretary and all the way to presidency. Um, listening to um, parents as well as stepping up and taking responsibility for any job that needs to be done. Um, working as a team with other people and working for that goal that you want. And our goal here is being on the school board is for education and educating and as well as student achievement and making those things happen. That's what I want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Kanye, followed by Chris Neary. First of all, I want to thank all of you for spending this evening here with us tonight. And I want you to rest assured if I'm elected as one of your board of trustees that I will look for the best, make all the best decisions possible for the best interests of all the children in this community. And when I say all the children, I mean all the children in this community because I look at all the children like I look at my own children. They're all just children and we need to look out for them. Thank you. Thank you. This is Chris, to be followed by Bob Colby. Well, first I'd like to thank the sponsors for putting this on. Uh, I'd like to uh, 
also thank all of you who have attended. Uh, I'd also like to thank the World's Weekly for putting out a, a fairly big uh, presentation of, of the, on the board uh, candidates' uh, views. Uh, but I think that we have an open public forum like this. And it's also a privilege and a gift to be able to vote. And so I hope all of us exercise that right and get out and vote on November 6th, if not before. Thank you all for coming. Miguel, drop the